One of the problems with talking to people about how things sound is the vocabulary. People who work in audio, and more specifically, people who work in acoustics, typically use words that sound familiar but mean something really specific. So the idea of this video is to explain a couple of important words and to demonstrate them at the same time. Right now you're listening to a recording made in a special room called an anechoic chamber. This means that there are no echoes in the room. An echo ik means without echoes or without reflections. So the sound that radiates outwards from my mouth hits the microphone first before going on to the wall behind it. And that wall looks just like this wall. The sound that goes that way hits the foam wedges. That foam absorbs all the sound, so it turns it into heat, and nothing bounces back. So there are no echoes coming back from anything in this room. The only sound that the microphone hears is the direct sound that comes straight from my mouth straight into the microphone. In order to set up a couple of things for some demos that are going to happen later in this video, let's talk a little bit about where you hear me. If you're listening to me over headphones or over a correctly configured stereo system, you probably hear me in the center of your head or in the center of the two loudspeakers. So if I move to the left of the microphone, you should hear me move to the left. I'm trying to stay the same distance from the mic so nothing else changes. Now I'm off to directly over to one side, and I'll come back to the center. So now you should hear me in the center again. If I move to the right, then you'll hear me move to the right. I'll move in a circle, and as I keep talking, you should hear me move over to the right, and I'll come back again. This is an effect called stereo imaging. There are a couple of limitations with two-channel stereo. The first is that it basically folds the universe in half. So right now I'm in front of you and in the middle. But if I walk around to the back of the camera, so now I'm directly behind the camera, you still hear me in the center in front. That's because stereo, with only two channels, doesn't have the ability to represent sounds in the front and in the back. It can only do a left-right and maybe a distance. That's why, uh, for some cases, you need to upgrade to a multi-channel system where you do have surround speakers and can get that front-back experience. Now I'm standing in a different environment, which is also anechoic, but it's anechoic for a different reason. Unlike the anechoic chamber, where the sound of my voice went out and got absorbed by those foam wedges, here I'm standing in a large football field, and so the sound of my voice goes out, and there's nothing for it to hit. There is nothing to reflect from, so there are no echoes. The one exception is maybe the ground. So there is some bounce off the, the grass here. So if I really wanted to be anechoic, I would find a very tall pole, and I would stand on that, and that would make the ground very far away, and I would have a completely anechoic environment. In fact, companies or institutions that have an anechoic chamber that want to find out how good it really is, will compare a measurement done in the anechoic chamber to a measurement done outdoors on a pole like that. The pole outdoors is the reference because it is anechoic, and any difference between that and the anechoic chamber shows you the error of the chamber, and then you can undo that error, hopefully, in the measurements that you do every day inside. Typically, if you talk to somebody who works in acoustics or in audio, they won't use the word anechoic very often, unless they're talking about an anechoic chamber. What they usually talk about is something called a free field, which is what we're standing in. What that means is that the sound is free to keep going forever without reflecting off of anything. Now I'm standing in a different place. Again, it's almost a free field. We have some reflection off the ground but we have that wall over there. And that wall is reflecting the sound of my voice. So the sound goes out, it hits the microphone at one meter away. It also goes in that direction, bounces off the wall, and comes back. You probably can't hear that reflection right now. You can't hear it as a separate echo because it's so quiet. And it's quiet for two reasons. One is that there's attenuation or reduction in the level caused by the distance to the wall and back. But the other is that the sound of my voice in that direction is quieter than it is in this direction because of the directional characteristics of my voice. But if I were to make a sound that is omnidirectional, so it radiates in all directions, and it's very short, 
then you'll hear the direct sound and the reflection as two separate things. So you can hear that echo coming in after the direct sound. There's another reason why it might be difficult to hear the echo coming from that wall over there, and that's the fact that it's coming from almost the same direction as my voice in the stereo image. That means that you're hearing those two sources, my voice and the echo, from the same location in that stereo perspective. So if we change that, if I rotate the camera so that the echo is coming from a, the side of the stereo image and I'm coming from the middle, it may be easier to hear that effect coming from a different location. So now I've rotated the camera so that I'm still in the center of the frame, but the reflection is coming from the right-hand side. If I clap my hands again, you can hear the direct sound is coming from the middle, but the echo is coming from the right. What I'll do now is change from stereo to mono and do this again. So I'm still going to keep everything exactly the same, I'll just switch the mix on the microphone output from stereo to mono. This is in stereo, and this is in mono. Stereo, mono. Of course, the stereo mono change is also obvious in other sounds around me, like the traffic noise, and the birds that are singing. I've now moved to a new location that is about half the distance that it was from me to the wall, and therefore the echo is going to come in at half the time that it used to. What that means is that it'll be louder, because it's twice as close, but also that it will come in earlier at half the time. So if I now clap my hands again, It's still possible to hear that echo as a separate sound, but it's becoming difficult because it's happening so early or so close in time to the direct sound. As I get closer to the wall, that will become harder and harder to distinguish as a separate source. And eventually, that echo becomes part of the direct sound, and it just acts as a coloration on the sound rather than acting as a separate source. Now I've moved even closer to the wall, I've half the distance again. And I'm getting to the point where I'm now so close that even though, by halving the distance, the reflection is twice as loud, it's now coming in so early, or so close to the direct sound, that it's hard to hear it as a separate sound. It just becomes a part of the direct sound. So if I clap my hands, you don't hear two separate sounds. You hear one thing that's blended together. This is a bit like film, in that if you were to take a movie and slow it down, you would see it as individual photographs, still photographs. There wouldn't be any motion that's captured. But if you play those photographs fast enough, your brain interprets that information as motion. The same thing is happening here. The direct sound and the reflection are coming so close together in time that your brain can't pull them apart. And so you don't hear it as two separate sounds, you hear it as one thing. That doesn't mean you can't hear the effect of the reflection. The reflection has a timbral effect. It changes the, the overall frequency balance of that total sound. So there is an effect on the sound caused by that reflection, but it's not interpreted by your brain as a separate sound. It's all one thing with the direct sound. Now I've obviously moved to a location that's very, very close to this wall. So the reflected sound that comes in off the wall is coming very, very soon after the direct sound, because the difference in distance between this path and that path is very small. And as I get closer to the wall, that path length difference gets smaller. As it gets smaller, what that means is that the level becomes almost the same, and the difference in time goes to zero. That means, at least when the reflection is so close in time, that it's almost impossible, it is impossible, to hear this reflection as a separate thing. It's just too close in time. However, 
the effect that that reflection has on the sound of my voice, on the timbre, is really noticeable. And that's mostly obvious if I make a wide band white noise sound like this. What you can hear as I move close to the wall is a kind of sound. What's happening is that as those two sounds get closer and closer together in time, the frequency where they're starting to interfere with each other gets higher and higher. So you can hear the effect of the reflection as a timbral effect rather than a temporal or a time effect. I'll do it again. What's also interesting is that if I then switch to mono, so I'm collapsing all of the stereo information into the center of the image, and I do this again, you'll notice that the effect is even more audible. So I'm switched to mono now, and you can probably hear that the effect on my voice has changed because the reflection and the direct sound are coming from the same place. If I do the noise test again, You can hear that effect is more obvious than it is in stereo, like this. This is why when you're recording a mono instrument, like a voice or a guitar amp, for example, you want to use two mics instead of one. The reason for that is that when you use two mics, you're recording the space around the instrument in stereo. Even though you have a mono source, you can have reflections from the surfaces around that source, like the guitar amp. And the more you can take those reflections and move them away from the source, you have less of an effect on the timbre of the source. If you use one microphone, everything is collapsed into that one point in space like when I do this in mono. Whereas if you record in stereo, you still have a mono source, but you've taken the reflections in the room and distributed those over space, and you have a smaller timbral effect, and therefore you get more clarity in the recording. If you're in a room that has a lot of reflections coming from a lot of different places over a long period of time, then you have an effect called reverberation or reverb. Lots of people will call this echo, but it's not. So the room I'm in now has a lot of reflective surfaces. There's stone and wood and plaster and glass and concrete. So the sound of my voice goes out, that hits the microphone, but most of it goes in other directions and then bounces off of those surfaces, just like light bounces off a mirror. Some of those reflections come back and hit the microphone a little bit later, but most don't. Most go in another direction and hit another surface and then bounce back again. And those reflections keep going and going and going. And the end result is that you get this long series of reflections coming in from all of the surfaces in the room that together sounds like one thing that we call reverberation. Now I'm in a different, much smaller room than the previous one, but it also only has hard, flat surfaces. So I still get reverberation, but the overall sound of that reverb is different than the previous room, and that's partly because the density of the reflections in time is much higher. In other words, because these walls are so close and the sound doesn't take very long to get across the room, the reflections are coming in much closer to each other than they did in the previous room. There are other reasons why this room sounds so different, but that's one of them. I'm back in the anechoic chamber to talk about a different issue, and that's distance perception, or how you perceive distance to a sound source. If you only have your hearing to rely on, then you're using a couple of different aspects of the sound that, in combination, help you with distance estimation. Assuming that the sound is not really close to you, like a mosquito flying into your ear, then the two most important aspects of the sound that you rely on are how loud it is and the relationship between the direct sound and the reverberant or the reflected sounds. And that balance is what gives you a lot of the information about how far away things are in the room that you're in. 
Here in the anechoic chamber, there are no reflections, at least in theory. So if I move further away from the microphone in this room, I just get quieter. The reason for that is that the sound from my voice goes out like a ball that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And for each little area on that ball, it's becoming less and less of the total area of the ball. So the further away I stand, then the ball at the distance to the microphone is bigger, so the amount of sound hitting the microphone is less. I'm not speaking any quieter, I'm just quieter at the microphone because I'm further away. And if I come back in, then I will get louder and louder. If I half the distance, I get twice as loud. If I half that distance again, I get twice as loud again. So every time I double the distance, I get half as loud. If I double the distance again, without falling off, then I get half as loud again. But because I'm in an anechoic chamber and there are no reflections, I could basically get the same effect by just turning down the level. So if I stay here and I keep talking, but I use a fader inside my editing software to turn down the level like this, then I get basically the same effect. I'm not changing anything else because there is nothing else in this room coming back into the microphone to change. While we're standing here outside in this anechoic environment, let's talk about distance perception again. This should behave the same way as it did in the anechoic chamber, because there are no echoes here, there are no reflections, so the only thing that should change while I change my distance is the level of my voice. I'll keep talking at hopefully the same level, and I'll half the distance. I'll go from one meter to 50 centimeters to the camera and the microphone, and then I'll go back again to the one meter mark. When I half that distance, so if I come back to 50 centimeters, I half the distance, that means I get two times the level of my voice. That's equivalent of a six decibel increase. So here I'm six dB louder than I am right here at the one meter mark. If I then double my distance and go back to two meters away from the microphone and the camera, now I've dropped by half and therefore a 6 dB reduction in the level of my voice without having changed anything. I'm still trying to talk at the same level, and I haven't changed the, the level of the fader in the software, for example. If I go back to 4 meters, so now I've doubled that distance again, that's another half. So this is one quarter of the 1 meter distance level. That means I'm down by 12 dB. Still talking at the same level, no reflections, so you should hear a significant drop in the level of my voice. If I double again, so now I'm going from 4 meters to 8 meters, now I've halved again. So now I'm down to a level of 1 eighth of what it used to be. From 1 to 2, which is a half, to 4, which is a quarter, to 8, which is an eighth. That means I'm now 6, 12, 18 decibels down from where I started. If I double the distance again and go out to the 60 meter mark, then I have 1 16th of the level. That I had at one meter, so now I'm standing 16 meters away from the camera and the microphone. That means I'm now 1 16th of the level, which is 6, 12, 18, 24 dB down. Again, I haven't changed anything. I'm still trying to talk at the same level. I haven't changed anything in the mix, in the gain of the microphone. I'm just getting the distance resulting in an attenuation of the level of my voice. I'll come back in, still talking same level from 16 meters to 8 meters, which is a 6 dB boost, to 4 meters, which is another 6 dB boost, to 2 meters, to 1 meter. So hopefully that difference in level was quite audible because it would have been the same as making a 24 dB change on a fader on the mixer, for example. Now I'm back in that room with a lot of reflections and therefore a long reverberation time. If I change the distance in this space, the distance effect is more obvious. This is because right now what you're hearing is the sound of my voice and the sound of the reverberation. And if I get closer, the sound of the reverberation doesn't change, but the sound of my voice gets louder. As I go back, then I have some relative level between the level of my voice and the level of the reverberation. Remember that the reverberation is just the sound that goes out from my voice to the room, bounces around, and comes back. So no matter where I am in the room, that level will stay the same. So as I move further away, 
the sound of my voice, the direct sound, will get quieter, just like it did in the anechoic chamber. And at some point, I reach a distance where those two are the same. The amount of energy coming in from my voice and the amount of energy coming to the microphone from the room are the same level. And that's called the critical distance of this room. If I go outside that critical distance, so I keep backing away, my voice will get quieter and quieter and quieter, but the level of the reverb stays the same. So as I get further and further away, we get to a point where most, if not almost all, of the energy that you hear from that microphone is the sound of the reverberation in the room. That's because the sound of my voice at the microphone is so quiet that it basically contributes nothing to the total sound. So all you're hearing is reverberation. As I come back in, I'm not changing the sound of the reverberation, the level of the reverberation. I'm just bringing the direct sound up and up and up and changing the balance between those two things. And that balance is one of the things you use to decide how far away something sounds. One other aspect of this is the question of spaciousness. So if I stand here, for example, and I speak, you can hear spaciousness in the reverberation. That's that sense of width. If I then take the microphone, and instead of playing in stereo, I play in mono, like this, you can still hear the reverberation in the room, but that sense of space is gone. And part of what's happening now is that because I've collapsed everything into one location in the stereo image, the reverberation is clouding the sound of my voice. If I go back out to stereo again and keep talking, you can hear that it's probably easier to understand what I'm saying because the reverberation is not clouding the sound, because your brain is able to separate the sound of the reverberation from the sound of my voice. And you have the ability to do this with something called the cocktail party effect, where you can hear what somebody's saying in a cocktail party and ignore all those other voices around you. The same is true when you're listening to my voice in a reverberant space. If I go very far away, where I'm outside the critical distance, and now most of what you're hearing is reverb, if I again switch this to mono, so I take away all that spatial contribution of the room and collapse everything into one place, it becomes, again, more difficult to hear what I'm saying because all of that information is being piled into one location in the stereo image. This is a good reason why if you are doing a microphone setup on a drum kit or a singer or a guitar amp in a room, it's always better to use two mics than one mic. If you have one mic, then you have the guitar amp and the room all in one place. Whereas if you have a stereo pair of mics on a single guitar amp, then you'll have a spacious room and a guitar amp placed in it, so you get much more clarity. This is another kind of space, which is also very reflective. So we have very hard walls. We have glass on this side, concrete, concrete above, and wood below. So everything is reflecting the acoustic information in the room. So we have a lot of reflections and therefore a lot of reverb. But this is a kind of a strange space because those two sidewalls are so close to each other. What that means is that you're going to get kind of a, uh, a perception of mono or uh, you, you won't get the spaciousness that you got in that other room because we don't have the the distance to the sidewall. So those first reflections that come in come in very early. And so you don't get that sense of space that you would get in the other room. That also means that if I move further and further away in this same space, we have basically the same amount of reverb that we had in the other room because it's just an attachment of that same room. But as I get further and further away, all of that reverb is coming from almost one area in the stereo image. So what you get is almost like what we would have had in that mono case, where we had, instead of stereo microphones in the big reverberant space, we have a mono recording. That's not happening here. I'm still recording in stereo. I haven't collapsed a mono yet. I could collapse a mono. That's what I'm doing now. So you're now hearing this same space, but recorded in mono instead of stereo. And then I switch back to stereo, like this, and now you can hear that there is width in this room but that width is quite restricted, and that's because these walls are so close to each other. Again, we still have that same issue that we had in the bigger room, where 
you have a critical distance. So most of the sound that you hear from my voice right now is coming from the reverberation. It's not the direct sound because that's so quiet. But as I get closer and closer, it sounds like I'm getting closer and closer because that direct sound is becoming louder and louder relative to the reverb.